Well, good morning. It's, it's good to be with you again and appreciate the, uh, the invitation of the elders here to come and to talk to you uh, from God's Word this morning. I do hope, as you see on the screen, it says uh, inspirational message. I do hope that this message will uh, inspire you in some way uh, today to live as God would have us to, to live. Okay, so over the past, oh, I think since January in, uh, in Clovis where I preach, we have been uh, going through a series of studies on the book of James. And so I encourage you to take out your Bible and turn to the book of James, and we will uh, be talking from chapter 5 this morning. James chapter 5. Now, you, you might remember uh, some time ago, I remember my first uh, you know, experience with this board game was back in the 80s, and it might have predated that period of time, but I definitely know that it took place at, at that time. It was very popular. And the game, if you remember, is called Trivial Pursuit. And a lot of us probably have played Trivial Pursuit. And one of the things that you, if you remember about that game, your, your piece that identified you uh, was a little round circle, and it had little, little cutouts, little pie-shaped spaces that when you answered a certain question, that you would be able to place a color corresponding to that category into your piece. And then when you finished all of those and then answered some a general question at the end, and that would declare you the winner. And in those pieces, if you remember right, you know, there'd be one I think was like geography, and one was sports, and one all different, different types of subjects. And the reason I bring that up is because in a lot of ways, I think we as Christians, if we're not careful, we can start to live our lives kind of like that piece where we have different segments of our life, where one part of our life might be uh, about our work life, and another part of our, uh, of our life, and a little wedge might be about our activities or our hobbies, and another part might be about our family and our relationships. We can go around and we can see all different sorts of pieces, and one of those pieces we might designate as, okay, this is my spiritual life. This is my spiritual life. Now here's the problem with that. The problem is as Christians, our life is not one part of who we are. That is, our life in Christ is not one part of who we are, but rather our life in Christ it, it takes every aspect and it's governed by every aspect of who we are. And so when we talk about our relationships, our relationships are, are directed by God's Word. Our, our work life is directed by God's Word. Our, our uh, you know, hobbies are directed by God's Word. Every aspect of who we are is directed by God's Word. And so God is not to be one part of our life. He is to be our entire life. One person said it this way. He said, the way we live our lives every day has eternal consequences. It really does, doesn't it? Because what we do and how we live is every day a demonstration to three different groups of people. It's a demonstration, first of all, to God. And it's a demonstration to those that are around us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But then it is also a demonstration to us. Now we might ask the question, what is it that we are demonstrating? Every day, whether we are sheltering at home or out in society when things return to normal, every day we demonstrate who we follow who we are. Are we followers of Christ? Or are we followers of some man-made philosophy or our own wills? We demonstrate who it is that we trust. 
when life gets rough, who do we trust? Do we trust God to deliver or do we trust our own ingenuity and our self-mind and our thinking and our, our own will? We demonstrate what's important to us, what's valuable. Each and every day, we, we communicate to God, those that are around us, and to ourselves. What we're talking about this morning is how we live our lives. The Bible gives a lot of different pictures about how we live. Paul and his epistles in Ephesians, as well as in Philippians and uh, Colossians, he uses the idea of we walk. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, a walk uh, worthy of the Lord. In, in, in Philippians, his walk worthy of the gospel of Christ. But there's a phrase that is used in Scripture that I want to draw your attention to, and that is in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 4. Now, Paul quotes this passage later in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. But what Paul quotes is just the very end. I want you to hear what he says, what Habakkuk says at the very end, and that is, the righteous shall live by faith. As God's people, we are to live by our faith, that is, the faith that comes from God's word. In Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 20, the apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we walk by faith not by sight. So we have to ask the question, if God is calling us to a certain kind of life, a life that is not segmented, but a life that's fully devoted to Him, a life that Scripture says is living by faith, we have to ask the question, what does that look like? What's that look like? And that brings us to the book of James. Because the book of James in, in Scripture, I think, is one of the greatest portrayals of what God calls us to. To me, it's very similar in content and style to what we see in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't think that should be a surprise to us, because James, the author of the book, is most likely the brother of Jesus and would have understood those things that Jesus communicated. So when we look at the book of James, we discover that a genuine faith is to make a genuine difference in the way a person lives every day. To put it simply, what we believe should direct and determine our behavior. How we act. So what James does is in several different sections in the book, he gives a picture of faithful living, what it means to live by faith. And of course, the, the core of that, the heart of that we see in chapter 2, that faith without works is dead. But there's so much more about that in this book. I just want to give one element that's in chapter 5 and a verse 13 through verse 18. We're going to read that in just a moment. I want us to look at this from this perspective. Over the past three months, we have found ourselves in this country and even throughout the world in a, a unique situation, a situation that we have not experienced personally. It's happened before, but we have not experienced it. And, and that is a, a, a virus that really has caused, in a lot of ways, our lives to shut down. And it's caused our nation to kind of shut down and our economy to shut down. And so what has happened, as we are so very familiar with, is that there's been a lot of attention to the physical issues around COVID-19, whether it be sheltering in place or how we wash our hands or how we wear masks. And I am very thankful 
that there's been attention given to that. But there's another element that I think is starting to gain more and more steam, and that is there needs to be a focus on the emotional and the mental issues that have arisen with this situation. There are a lot of people that live alone, and that creates the feelings of depression and loneliness and isolation and fear and and so it's important as we move to where we are getting beyond this to understand there's a lot of anxiety and inner turmoil that needs to be addressed with the same kind of focus that we have addressed the physical issues. And I think that's important to understand that we need to do that, but it's beyond just COVID-19. As Christians, how we deal with the situations that are unexpected and unnerving and unwanted is very important. How we deal with the people who are hurtful rather than helpful, cruel rather than compassionate, selfish versus selfless, and loveless versus loving. So how do we do that? As Christians, we choose, go ahead and advance to the next slide, we choose the life of living in faith every day. Do you ever see that life spells that out? And as Christians, we live in faith every day versus the opposite, and that is living in fear every day. How do we live in faith every day? People who live by faith. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 18 will tell us. They are a people of prayer. They're a people of prayer. Let's move ahead in the next slide and we'll read James chapter 5 and verse 13 beginning. Read with me. It says, Is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And move forward to the next one. And therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature that is like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Faith, if we look at the next slide, faith is one that manifests itself in the dedication and in the commitment to prayer. Faith prays. Now, to me, this is interesting. I want you to think about the book of James and the concept of prayer throughout the book. First of all, I already alluded to the fact that I think that the, the book was authored by James, the brother of Jesus, and there's a lot of reasons why I think that is the case. Uh, James the Apostle was dead by the time of, of the writing of this book. Uh, James the other Apostle, James the Less, is not so well known. And so when we look at all these James, we kind of will it down and we get to James, the brother of Jesus. And the interesting thing was, you remember when Jesus was alive in his ministry, his brothers did not acknowledge him. It wasn't until Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to James, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that James was convinced. And then we start to see that James in the history of the church in the first century as being a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. What religious tradition tells us about James? It's that James was a man so given to prayer and worship that his knees grew hard and callous to the point where they, they resembled camel's knees. And he had the nickname Old Camel's Knees because he would be on his knees praying so often for the church and for the brethren and for himself and, and so much. But that's religious tradition. Let's look at the book. Do you realize that James starts his book in chapter 1 with the concept of prayer 
And he ends the book in chapter 5 with the call to prayer. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, count all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the trial of your faith works patience. And let patience have its perfect work that you might be complete, lacking in nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, verse 5, let him ask God. And then what we have here in chapter 5 and verse 33 is about prayer. And then, if you want to just focus on chapter 5 and verse 13 through 18, notice that in every single verse, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, every time the word prayer or the concept of prayer is specifically mentioned. Why is that? Because people who live by faith are people who pray. Why? Because prayer establishes within us a dependence on the divine. That we need God in our lives. It, it establishes a dependence on his resources. I can't do this alone. Jesus understood that as he prayed. I can't do this on my own, so I need your resources. And in the garden, Jesus received God's resources. What that does, dependence on the divine and the divine's resources, it helps us to have a heart that endures. That's why prayer is so important. I want to give you the four situations, specific situations, that James mentions are times that call for prayer. The very first one, verse 13, the very first beginning of that verse, is that we are to pray when we are concerned. Is anyone among you suffering? Our brother that read uh, the scripture for us this morning uh, was reading from a translation, and in that translation it was, is anyone among you in trouble? See, the word here for suffering in the English standard or it is not talking about physical suffering. It's not talking about physical illness or physical affliction. It's talking about emotional affliction. It's talking about anxiety. It's talking about hardship that we feel inside. It's that distress. And so what James is saying to us is, if you are distressed, pray. How is it we typically respond to distressing circumstances or situations that make us anxious? How do we respond? A lot of times what we do is we grumble, we complain. I don't like where I'm at in my life. I don't like the situation in my life. We might blame others for our problems. We might blame the Lord for our problems. And all we do is we murmur and complain. You don't realize there's people like that in Scripture? When God brings the nation of Israel up out of Egypt and he demonstrates by his mighty hand, his great power, what was it that they did every time they turned around? They murmured. They complained. They grumbled. What James says is rather than grumble and complain, we should be humble and pray. How does that help us? with our emotional pain. In some situations, we can pray that whatever it is that's distressing us, that, that it would be taken away from our lives, and God might answer that prayer. But you know what? It might not happen that way. Paul had something that was distressing in his life in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, a thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, it afflicted him so that he would be humbled and he asked that it would be taken away, and God said, No, my grace is sufficient for you. See, prayer may remove or prayer may not remove, but what prayer always does is it gives us the grace to endure and the grace to grow. All in Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, 
with supplication and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You get the connection there? What Paul says is, don't be anxious. And he proceeds that just before with the Lord's a hand. We, we've talked about that in previous sermons I, I've given, and that is, it's like Jesus is right there with you. Therefore, don't be anxious. But what you do is you pray, and in your prayers you be thankful. And if you're thankful... God's peace is going to be in your life. You ever have those kinds of situations where you're just full of anxiety and, and distress and discomfort, and you pray, and what happens? You leave it with God. And the distress is gone. Oh, the situation's still there. But I've entrusted it into someone who's much better at dealing with the situation than I. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Again, notice the connection. Humble yourself. How many times do we think, oh, I can do it myself? He says, no, humble yourself and cast your anxieties on God, and God, who cares for you, will exalt you. So we are to pray when we're concerned. The second part of verse 13 knows what it says. Is anyone among you or any, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Oh, you say, oh, wait a second. We're talking about prayer. Now this talks about praise. When we sing a song of praise, what are we basically doing in essence? We're praying, aren't we? Well, we praise God from whom all blessings flow. What are we doing? We're, we're communicating with Him. We're expressing our hearts. Praise and pray are very similar concepts. And so what he says is, if you are cheerful, let Him sing. Let Him praise. Let Him pray. That word cheerful is interesting because it's only found one other time in Scripture. In Acts 27, verse 22, when the Apostle Paul is on the ship and, and he's comforting the people, he says, I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He says, take heart. It's the same word, cheerful. Let you be cheerful. See, cheerful means to have heart, to have courage, to have strength. Take heart. Why? In the fact that God, our God, is a God for all seasons. Whether you are in the valley or on the peaks of the mountain, He is your God and He is over all. Not every one of us is going through troubles right at the same time. So what do we do? If you are on the peak of the mountain in your life, life is going pretty well for you right now. Remember and rejoice in God. But if you're in a valley, remember and rejoice in God. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted. You're on the peak of the mountain and you're singing because you're cheerful. Don't forget your brethren that are struggling in the valley. Help them. Encourage them. The third situation that James calls us to pray is to pray when we are crippled. Verse 14 through verse 16. Now I want to take a little bit of time here in this passage because this is definitely a difficult passage here, these three verses, to understand exactly what James is saying. He says, if anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. I, I've been in a number of Bible classes where we have discussed what is it that this actually means. I'll give you my understanding, just for your consideration. You might not agree with this, but I want you to consider. 
what it is that James, I think James is saying. The word for sick here is the Greek word asthenia. And the word is used a number of times in scriptures. Of 18 times in scripture in the New Testament, it is about being physically sick. Physically under the weather, if you would. Physically, you know, not able to act because your body is not operating the right way. 14 times. It's not physical sickness. It's emotional or spiritual weakness. Let me give you a couple of passages. In Acts chapter 20 and in verse 35, he says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, is more blessed to give than to receive. He's not talking about someone who's physically sick. He's talking about someone who is physically struggling or emotionally struggling, or spiritually struggling. In Romans chapter 14, the strong ought to bear with the weak. Same word. He's not talking about someone physically sick. He's talking about someone who is spiritually struggling. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, again, talking about the difference between strong and weak and not putting up obstacles in front of the weak. Or what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when when God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Same word. And then Paul goes on from there. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more most gladly of my weaknesses. Same word. For the sake of Christ, and I am content with weakness. Same word. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's the same exact word. So what is it that James is saying? Because in every instance within the epistles, with the exception of only three, Philippians chapter 2, verse 26, 27, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, he's not talking about physical illness. He's talking about spiritual illness. And this fits with James. If you notice in James chapter 1, or verse 1, he writes to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Now, he uses the term 12 tribes because he's talking to people that are of Jewish descent. The dispersion is what happens in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 when the church is persecuted in Jerusalem and they spread. And so James is concerned with those that are emotionally and spiritually weak. What's he say? If you're spiritually struggling, you're at the end of your rope spiritually. Call for the elders. Why? Because the elders are the ones that are spiritually strong. They're the ones that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 have met the qualifications of someone who's mature in the faith. He says, you call for them. And then let them anoint him with oil. And yeah, that's kind of an interesting picture here. Because we kind of get the picture of anointing oil maybe with a couple of drops or something like that. Maybe that's what they did as a custom. In some ways they did. But the word anoint here is not just pouring a little bit. It's crushing over. It is rubbing. It's not a small amount. This is a large amount. Here's the point. Let's put it in an illustration that we would understand today. What do you do when your muscles are sore? We get ointment and oil, and we, we massage those 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 muscles with that oil why to renew them and that's the metaphor that's going on here when your spiritual strength is sore and when it is depleted and you're hitting rock bottom call the elders and they will come and pray over you and anoint you with oil in other words they're going to massage your spirit encourage you you get that metaphor in isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6 in that chapter it talks about how the nation is turned away from god he says they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil they're not softened with oil their spirit is down and so in verse 15 james says you call for the elders verse 14 call for the elders when you're spiritually weak, they'll, they'll pray over you. They'll anoint you with oil. They'll massage your spirit. 
And verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. You know, we sing a song. Did you think to pray? Listen to the lyrics. Oh, how praying rests the weary. When sore trials came upon you, did you think to pray? When your soul was full of sorrow, balm of Gilead, did you borrow? Then James says, and the Lord will raise him up. Let's not look at this as the Lord is going to raise him up and is going to heal him physically. No, the Lord is going to restore him. The Lord is going to excite him. The Lord is going to awaken him. And if he has committed sins, well, wait a second here, because this is where I've always had the issue. If we're praying for the elders because I'm sick and they're going to do all of this and I'm going to be raised up, what does my sickness have to do with my sin? Sometimes physical sickness results from sin, but that's not always the case. So what does it have to do with physical sickness to have my sins forgiven? Very little. But with spiritual sickness, it has a tremendous aspect or point to be made. Because why do we become spiritually weak? Because of sin. And, and when we sin, we do so because we are spiritually weak. Just consider this. What James says is if you're at the end of your rope, spiritually, you just spiritually you are struggling. Call for those that are spiritually strong. Call for someone that you can confide in and speak to you. Let them pray with you and have your spirit excited, restored, awakened. If you have sin that puts you in that situation, ask for it to be forgiven. So what does he say? He says, pray when you're concerned, when, when you're just anxious. Pray when you're cheerful. Things are going well. Pray when, when you're crippled spiritually. You're, you're just really struggling. Call for the elders and pray. And what's he do at the end? Verse 17 and verse 18. He starts talking about Elijah. And what the point, the reason is, is because Elijah is this great example of prayer. And he talks about how Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and didn't rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed again and it did rain. We know that story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and chapter 18. But there's something else about it, and that is this. Why did Elijah pray for there to be no rain? Because Elijah was praying for his community. Who was the king at that point in time? It was Ahab. Do you remember what kind of man Ahab was? He was the worst king. And so what's Elijah doing? He is wanting and he is praying for the nation to repent and for there to be a change. He's praying for the king to repent and for the king to, to, to change. We need to be willing to pray for our community, to pray for our government. What James says in, in, in using this illustration is, if your government is oppressive, what do you do? You pray. If the government is persecuting, what is it Christians are to do? Christians are to pray. If the government causes pain, causes suffering, what are you to do? You're to pray. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Pray for your leaders. See, we don't take up arms. We don't revolt. What does the Christians do? Christians we pray to the one who has the power over the powers that be. We pray to God. You look at our situation in our society. I know there's been a lot of debate as to whether or not government is persecuting the church by restricting public worship. I don't know if anyone has 
that answer. Where I live, our, our restrictions are being relaxed. Here in the Bay Area, San Jose, you're a little bit behind that, but you will get there as well. So whether or not the church is being oppressed, I don't know. But Christians don't take up arms. Christians don't revolt. What Christians do is Christians pray. We pray for resolution of a pandemic. We pray for wisdom in our leaders. We pray for courage in our leaders to make the right decisions. We pray for patience and respect in people. And we pray like Elijah did. That in times like we find ourselves today, whether it be with physical ills or societal ills that we've seen over the past several weeks, we pray for an awakening to what really matters. An awakening to love each other as Christ loved us. An awakening to know that this life is short and we're all going somewhere else. We're either going to be in a place where there is no sickness, there is no death, or we'll be separated from God eternally. So what do Christians do? We live in faith every day. If you're concerned, pray and find the peace of God. If you're cheerful, and life is going well for you. Praise God for the provision that he has given. You're spiritually weak, spiritually crippled. Call and pray for the others. And be encouraged by their prayers. And be encouraged by the word of God. If you're concerned for your community, pray. Why do we pray? Because God is powerful and God works. I appreciate you listening this morning. I know we're all separated again. So uh, as I've said in the past, I'll, I'll, I'll say again, if you have any spiritual need that needs to be met, whether it's to obey the gospel or to, to make something right in your life, I encourage you to call uh, the elders of this congregation, and they will make sure that they uh, help you in whatever way you can. Thank you for having me here uh, this weekend. Thank you for having me and my wife. And we appreciate uh, the, the brethren here and the kindness that's been shown to us over the past uh, past couple of days. And we pray that, that no matter what, God's will will be done. He will be glorified in the church here at East Foothill.